Hello and welcome to the BYU Library Family History Webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on January 26th with Catherine Grant. She will be giving a presentation on best practices for entering information in Family Search, Family Tree Part 1, General Principles. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Laura Leffler, who will be giving a presentation on Southern Research Part 2, Proving Relationships with Vital Records. Before we begin, here is a little bit about Laura. Laura has a Bachelor of Arts in English and History from BYU. She is a retired English and U.S. History teacher. She also has a Salt Lake Community College Genealogy Certificate, a ProGen Certificate, and is an IC. CAP Gen accredited genealogists with a focus on the Upper South, which includes Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. All of her ancestors are from the Upper South, and she has spent most of her childhood living throughout the South and loved it. For the past five years, she's been a volunteer at the BYU Family History Library in Provo, Utah, helping patrons with their family history. And if Laura is ready, we can go ahead and let her share her screen. This presentation is geared to the beginner, but if you're not a beginner, I hope it will be a good review for you. So what does every genealogist want? We want to trace our family back to famous people, people we can be proud to be related to. Royalty, great public political leaders and strong and brave people who made it into the history books. Do you know that at one time I was related to Kentucky frontiersman Daniel Boone? I was so excited when I discovered several family trees all showing a clear line back to Daniel Boone. I told stories about him to my children. I bought tons of books about him. I even have a grandchild named Boone. But guess what? I am 95% sure that I am not related to Daniel Boone. Because now that I've looked at the documentation, I cannot prove one of the relationships back to Boone. It's very likely that two men in Kentucky got mixed up who had the same name, who both married a woman with the same first name. One of them was related to Boone and the other one wasn't. But in my unsuccessful quest to find connections with the famous, I've discovered hardworking, strong, brave ancestors with great stories, and I can prove I'm related to them. So how do you prove a relationship to extend your line? Well, there are lots of ways. Here are some of the best record types to use to prove relationship in Southern research. Census, tax, cemetery, military, land, probate, and vital records. One of the most important is vital records. This webinar, Southern Research Part Two, focuses on vital records and how they are excellent for proving relationships to extend your line. When I speak of vital records, I'm referring to birth, marriage, and death records. Vital records prove a relationship. They're created at or near the time of a birth, marriage, or death, which makes it more likely to be accurate. I have a birth certificate. That proves my birth date, my birthplace, and the names of my parents. My marriage certificate proves my relationship to my husband. My parents' death certificates proves their death date and death place, and also provides other valuable information. However, you need to be aware that civil registration for births and death certificates didn't generally begin on a statewide level in the United States until the early 1900s. So here are the objectives for this webinar. What's the history of vital records? Where can we find vital records? What information can we learn from birth, marriage, and death records? And what other sources can provide birth, marriage, and death information? 
what led up to the states finally mandating that birth and death records should be kept. Here's a little US history. In colonial times, from the earliest times of settlement till we became the United States in 1776, churches were the first to conduct registrations of christenings, marriages, and deaths in the colonies. Virginia and Massachusetts established birth, marriage, and death registrations in the 1630s, but the laws were rarely enforced only few records were created or even survived. After we became the United States, our country decided in 1790 to start gathering information on population for the purpose of taxation and representation. A 1790 census categorized members of the family into age ranges, which gives researchers approximate ages in the family, but only the head of the family was listed so there's no exact age and there's no proof of relationship. It wasn't until the 1880 census that marriage and relation information was gathered. The 19th century was concerned about collection of public health statistics. From 1850 to 1880, mortality schedules were included in the censuses. These schedules enumerated individuals who had died in the year prior to the census year. These schedules also included the date and cause of death. This proved the death and often included the names of parents, which proved relationship. In the late 19th and 20th century, child labor reform began to protect children from entering the workforce too young. Proof of age was needed. Social security was enacted into law in 1935. Proof of birth was required to qualify for social security. So many returned to the county of their birth and filed a delayed registration of birth. Because delayed birth records were filed years later, they may list births as early as the 1870s. Also from 1815 to 1950, 15, 30 million European immigrants poured into America. Cities were struggling to keep up. Who were all these people in the US? In World War II, defense plants needed workers, but by law, they could only hire Americans. A birth certificate was required. For our government to represent all of the people, we need an account of all the people, their names, their birth date, where they were born and who were their parents. It took us a while, but by the early 1900s, states began to mandate birth and death certificates. Okay, so here's a chart of the Southern states. The earliest state to mandate recording of births and deaths was Florida in 1899. By the way, ignore the arrow on that dot because I don't know how to remove it. So it sometimes points in the wrong direction. The earliest year when a state complied with the mandate was Louisiana in 1911 for deaths. And in 1917, Kentucky had generally complied uh, for births and deaths mandated in Kentucky. There was no uniformity as you can see by looking at this chart. You might find a birth record, but you're not gonna find a birth certificate for someone born in the 1800s, unless it's from a delayed birth certificate, which means it was recorded years later after the birth. So where are the state mandated births and death records held? They're, well, they're not gonna be held in the federal government because the state mandated it. The state health department or the office of vital statistics should have records from the time births and deaths records were mandated in their state. There also may be copies of earlier records kept by the county or city before the mandate in the state library, the state archive, or the state historical society. Just today, I called the Office of Vital Records for Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. Tennessee Vital Records Office said that they kept their birth and death records for 100 years. North Carolina and Virginia have records, birth and death records from the year of the state mandate, 
But then Virginia also has birth records from 1853 to 1896. So in other words, it varies from state to state. But some counties kept records of births and deaths earlier than the state mandated it. So where can you find those? Well, it depends where you are. The county register of deeds may have records of births and deaths earlier than what it's held at the state level. The county historical society, the county libraries, the county archives often have copies of early records. They might even have the original records. Also, some cities kept earlier records than the rest of the county. For instance, in North Carolina, the cities of Raleigh and Wilmington kept birth and death records very early. Those city records may be held in the county or the city. I discovered when I called Raleigh, I said, where's your records for your city? And they says, well, there's a copy in the Olivia Rainey Library in Raleigh. And then there's a copy in the state archives. And then I looked at family search to say, it said that there's city records at the state. So go figure. So when in doubt, search by state on family search for location of their vital records or call a county archivist because they know where everything is. Also, when you call or you get online for a state or a county archive, library or historical society, always check to see if they have online records that you can access from home. But wait, there's more. What about independent cities? According to Wikipedia, quote, an independent city is a city that is not in the territory of any county, and it's considered a primary administrative division of its state, unquote, which means they often have their own courthouse. They may have their records either in the city or the county courthouse. For example, Virginia has the most independent cities. They have 38. So the point is, when searching for records, it depends on the state where the records are going to be. Records before they were mandated could be in a variety of places. So always spread your net wide when you're searching for vital records and do not give up. You will find them if they're there. So where do I start? Well, hopefully you have completed a census survey that was discussed in Southern Research Part 1. If you have, then you should have some idea of the age range and location of where the ancestor lived that you're going to research. Then you want to go online to begin looking for vital records. Family search, ancestry, find my past, and my heritage have online some of the early vital records for the state or county. All four of these online databases have a contract with an archive or a repository to either digitize or acquire for money a copy of some of their records to be put online. But each site often has different record collections, so it's wise to check all of them. A lot of what Family Search and Ancestry have are vital record indexes, but some of them link to the original records. Indexes are valuable because they have the information that leads you to find the original record where it is usually held in the county. Family Search does a great job of teaching you the research process and how to find records. Ancestries, AncestryAcademy.com has great short videos on how to locate records on their site and good examples of records that you might find there. Find My Past has an excellent marriage collection. My Heritage has a huge record collection of mostly European countries, but they also have a great collection of United States newspapers that include obituaries, uh, which might include good vital information. So for this webinar, I'm focusing only on family search because it's free. And their state sites have web links that take you to vital records for ancestry, find my past and my heritage. Anyone can get a free membership to Family Search. However, because of their contracts with repositories, some of their records can only be viewed in a Family Search Center or one of their library affiliates. 
If you go to a Family Search Center or library affiliate, you have free access to view all the records on Ancestry, Find My Past, Family Search, or My Heritage. Here's how to find a Family Search Center or affiliate near you. Number one, you're going to go to the main page on Family Search. You're going to click on Search, and a drop down menu appears. Click on Research Wiki. Number two, the Family Search Research Wiki page appears, and on the left side column, click on either Family Search or Family Search Affiliate Libraries to find where the closest Family Search Center is to your home. Number three, a map's going to pop up and you're going to put your address up here so it, that can determine where the closest uh, Family Search Center is to you. And then up pops a center close to your location. There you can access all the records of Family Search Ancestry, Find My Past or My Heritage. FYI, you always want to call ahead to a Family Search Center. You want to make sure of their time availability because they're all manned by volunteers. But one more thing before you start looking at the records, you want to make sure that you know the history of the county boundaries in the state you're researching. County boundaries changed many times over the years. You don't want to spin your wheels looking for records in the wrong county. Here, here's a great site. It's called Atlas of Historical Boundaries. Here's the web address for you. Um, you want to, if you want to determine a state to, to research, click through how the county boundaries changed year after year. You may discover that your ancestor may have lived in the same place all his or her life, but that the county boundaries changed many times while they were living there, which means their records may end up in several different counties. Also be aware that your ancestors may have gone to the county courthouse that was the easiest to get to, not over a mountain or through a deep river, or they may have gone to the one that was the closest. If you can't find your ancestors in one county, always check out neighboring counties and don't forget that they actually may have gone to a closer courthouse that was over a state line. Another great way to see county boundaries changed is on family search. Choose a state, I'm gonna choose uh, Tennessee. If you wanna look at how the county boundaries changed in Tennessee, you're gonna Google Tennessee, United States genealogy family search. Under the heading Tennessee research tools, you're gonna to click on boundary changes for Tennessee counties. And then scroll down to interactive map of Tennessee County formation history. And there will be examples again of how the county boundaries changed over the years. It's really, really helpful. Now you are ready to start searching records. If you wanna learn exactly where the vital records are for your state, county, or city, you wanna to go to the Family Search Wiki. On the Family Search Research Wiki page, search for the state that you want to search. In my example, I'm searching for Tennessee. So you're gonna click on all the links to say, see where it takes you. You'll find links to birth, marriage, and death indexes and records, directions on how to find records. Uh, there was actually a link to the Tennessee State Library and Archives. They had a research guide that tells you what all of the rec vital records are that they have. And then there's also substitute records for birth, marriage, and death if you can't find a vital record. On the right side of this page is a column, this right here, with links that, it's, that are going to help you getting started researching. So go through their beginning research links. They're great. The vital records link down here. And then here's how you can get to archives and libraries and historical societies. And then there's another way for you to click on to find a family search near you. In the handout for this webinar, I have directions on how to navigate to the wiki page if you haven't had uh, that experience before. The Family Search Catalog is another great place to search. It's set up like a library catalog. It describes resources that Family Search, the Family Search Library, and even some of the Family Search Centers, what they have. 
It's a guide to a variety of genealogical records, books, periodicals, family histories, etc. Family Search has scanned many of their voluminous collection of family history books for your online access. It's fantastic. Number one, so you can search for records in their catalog by place. That's usually the first place I always go. That will show you all the records they have for that place in their catalog. If you search by place, you want to begin with country, state, and then county. You always go from largest to smallest when you're in the catalog. You can also search by surnames, titles, author, subjects, keywords, a call number, or even a microfilm number. So number two right here, when you're researching at the county level and you've got, you've pulled up everything from Wake County, this page will pop up. And on this page is also a section where you can look at records that they have collected for places within Wake County. So all these cities right here, this is where you can link to places within Wake County. Number three, and then below this on the page, uh, there's a section that has the different record types that Family Search has collected for Wake County. They have 18 entries for vital records for Wake County, which you can look at. And below it, they have six collections or six entries for vital records found in newspapers, which could be marriages or deaths. So it's very great place to go. Another place to search on Family Search are the family search records. So I put in the name North Carolina and the approximate year of Robert Miller's birth. We're gonna use North Carolina because I know he lived there part of his life. I think he was born around 1867. So that's gonna narrow it to a certain time period. Click search, two records pop up and both of them I noticed are the, from the index to vital records, 1800 to 2000. Well, that's cool, but this one right here, see this little icon right here, that means there's an image. So this is the one I'm gonna look at because I wanna, I want to um, look at the original record. This was proof of the birth of Robert L Miller Ellis's daughter, Anna Pearl Ellis. Well, I know that he also lived in Tennessee. So I did another search. This time, instead of North Carolina, I put in Tennessee because he lived there the latter part of his life. And find a grave pops up in Carter County, Tennessee, which will tell me information about his death and burial. And then also the 1870 census for Washington County, Tennessee popped up too. Uh, find a grave if you haven't had experience with that. It's a website that includes cemetery records. It's a substitute record that can help provide birth and death information. There's still more. On Family Search, another great place to search is in their collection of images. A historical image is a picture of a document like the birth certificate image in the upper right hand corner of this screen. Think about this Family Search has billions of records and they've only indexed about 20% of their collections because they're collecting records every day. Most, have, most of their records, because they haven't been indexed, are not going to be found in the catalog. So they provide these images for you to look through while they're in the process of getting things um, cataloged and indexed. Um, you have to search by place. You can't search by name because they haven't been indexed. In this example, I'm going to look for my ancestors in Augusta County, Virginia. And when it pops, when I put this, uh, the place in, it pops up with 425 results, which means there's 425 different sets of historical images for Augusta County, Virginia. Here are just five of them. There's wills, probate indexes, birth records, census records, militia records. Okay, I'm, I'm in the business of looking for vital records. So I wanna look at the Augusta County uh, Virginia birth records. There's 78 images. Remember, there's no index, so I'm going to have to scroll through them, but 78 images is not bad. So there's a source for you. Here are other two great free sites that can help you locate vital records. I love US Gen Web. 
because besides the links that they provide for all kinds of records, the best part for me has been finding out who's the coordinator for the county that I'm interested in. That's the person who knows all the answers to your questions and knows where all the records are in the county and can give you ideas of other places to search. Cindy's list right here is another free site with links to all kinds of record sets. I've screen captured just a section of the index for the state of Virginia. You can see that they have, there's a link to birth, marriage, and death records on Cindy's list as well. Okay, Whew. those sites should keep you busy for a while. There's plenty to do. So now let's talk about what information we can learn from vital records. We're gonna start with birth and death records. Here's an example of a delayed birth certificate. A delayed birth certificate does not mean the baby was born after its due date. It means that the birth certificate was not created at the time of birth and was created with proof of the birth, usually many years later. You'll find a lot of these when people wanted to qualify for social security. Virginia mandated that the birth records be kept in 1912, but here's a delayed birth certificate with a birth date on it of 1887. That is 25 years earlier than the state mandate. So don't forget to look at delayed birth certificates. Okay, now this is just a random person I pulled off of um, Ancestry, James Dofice Franklin Ferris. He was born out of wedlock because he says his parents were not married to each other. But here's a document proving not only his birth date and his birth place, but it proves the name of his parents, his father, Joseph Boswell, and his mother, Anne Eliza Ferris. You can see that James Ferris, as an adult, had took his mother's maiden name throughout his life. It lists his brother here, S.A. Ferris, as being a witness who can uh, confirm about his brother's birth. And there's also on here a Bible that they brought, 1860 Bible, um, as a source to show uh, that he was listed in the Bible, which is great because it probably has lots of more information on the other, fam other family members and, and you can try to track down where that Bible went. Here's an example of a birth index from Virginia recording birth records as early as 1853. Elizabeth McCready was born in 1853 in Washington County, Virginia. Now down here, I want you to focus on these three right here, Amelia, Caroline, and Ellen. And there's an asterisk by that indicating that they were enslaved and their birth year, they all three of them were born in 1866 in Amherst. This index provides the names of the child, the name of the parents, the, name, the date of birth, the place of birth, and this is the page number for the original record in the register. Whenever you come across an index, always try to find the original because many times the original record may contain more information that you'll want to know. This is an example of a birth register. The information in the index that we just looked at was taken from this birth register. A birth register is where the birth was originally recorded. This is also an example of the importance of using the index to find the original. In addition to what was on the index, you also learned the father's occupation, the name of the informant and his relationship to the child. So here is Elizabeth McCready in Washington County. Here's her birthday, white female born Washington County to John McCready and his wife, Margaret, of Washington County. John McCready is the informant, relationship is the father. And those three um, girls that were listed in the, in the index that were recorded as enslaved, here's, here they are together in Amherst County. It says November, 1866, Caroline McCrary, colored female born Amherst County, father Philip McCrary, Farmer and Francis McCrary of Amherst County, Virginia are the parents. The informant was Phil McCrary and 
the relationship was father. So that is great information that early. Here's the Virginia slave birth index. It's listing enslaved births from 1853 to 1866. That's not a huge long time period, but it's got great information. It includes the name of the enslaver, the enslaved, the name of the mother, the date of birth, the place of birth, with the page number from the original birth register. This is another great source for those who are researching African-American ancestry in Virginia. Here's an example of a death certificate taken from Ancestry. This is an official document, but from my own research, I know that there are several mistakes in it. For instance, Liddy Elizabeth Ellis is the name of the deceased, but her real name was Lydia Isabel Ellis. Her name, uh, the birthplace was spelled wrong. They've got Evert. She was born in Ewert, North Carolina. The deceased father is incorrect. I've got Cass and Goods. His real name was Cass and Gooch. The uh, Lydia's mother's last uh, mother's last name is spelled incorrectly. And the informant they've got here as Mrs. Paul Kirkpatrick, but in reality it was Pearl Kirkpatrick from Irwin, Tennessee. So lots of errors. Now, I know the informant was Pearl. I know that she was the daughter of the deceased and that Pearl was in the car with her mother when uh, they were in the car accident and Lydia was crushed to death. So this is a case of spelling errors by the recorder. Maybe there was some pronunciation problem. Maybe a Virginian because the death place was in Virginia. Maybe the Virginian couldn't understand an East Tennessean's accent. Maybe the recorder was hard of hearing. Who knows why there's so many mistakes. Um, the point is that this death certificate, while it has fantastic information, there are mistakes. So additional documents are really needed to corroborate and verify the information on this death certificate. Here's an example of death records you can find online for those cities or counties that kept records earlier than the state mandated. Both are death records from 1901. Uh, one is from Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, that was 12 years before the state mandated birth and death records. And the deceased birth date or birth year is 1877. That's really cool. Find something that early. Here's a, here's a death record from Elliott County, Kentucky that, in, that included Henry Coffey's birth date as March 15th, 1892. So that was 10 years before the state, state mandate. So both death records provide much of the same information. This, this white block here tells you what the information was on both, but the Elliott County, Kentucky death record includes additional information. It concluded the parents' names, their birthplace, the informant, the burial place, and the date. Here's an example of a death register, including deaths from 1862 in Montgomery County, Kentucky. I'm going to read this. Here's Dorinda Holden. Dorinda G. Holden, white, 19 female, single, died 3rd of July, 1862 of consumption, which is tuberculosis. She was born in Clark County. She resided in Montgomery County and died there. Names her parents, George and Lucy Holden, and that they were born in Clark County, Kentucky. Now this one, Thomas J. Green, white, 25 male, single, died. The thing that got me is the cause of death was shot by Judy. I, I tell you, this one took me down a rabbit hole because I was trying to figure out who, who Judy was for a while. Anyway, moving on. Um, and then Jordan, which is not, he was further down on this uh, page. Jordan, no last name, black, 58 male, died 3rd of December, 1862 of consumption. He was born in Montgomery County, resided there and died there. And his parent, he only has one parent listed, it's Harrison K. Wood. He, his, both of his parents were born in Montgomery County too. So if you think about that, 
1862 is when he died and he was 58. So he was born in 1804. So that is really cool to be able to track down. Let's talk about marriages. Marriages were recorded much earlier than birth and death records in the South, except South Carolina. Marriage records proved a relationship between a husband and a wife. A marriage record was especially important at the death of a husband, because if a woman was married to a man who had served in the Civil War for a certain amount of time or had been injured or killed in battle, she was entitled to a widow's pension. A woman had to prove her relationship to her husband and prove his death to acquire that pension. A marriage record was also important for the right to acquire property after a husband's death. Dower rights once entitled wives to one third of their husband's real property when he died. A woman needed to prove her relationship for the right of property. And most marriage records are kept by the county clerk. And then some states, they keep their marriage records at both the state and the county level. So you wanna check both. So let's talk about kinds of marriage records you can look at before the marriage took place. These are called records of intention to marry. Marriage bans were when a couple's intended marriage was announced in church, usually three weeks before the marriage date giving a chance for objections. Marriage bonds were written, promises of payment that uh, marriage was legal. The marriage would be legal. Consent papers by a parent or guardian were written up when the bride or groom was under age, if that was required in that county. Under age was 18 for a female and 21 for a male. The marriage license, was an application to marry usually from the county clerk. Here's some examples of uh, what you can find after the marriage was performed. A marriage record was when the minister, a marriage, excuse me, a marriage return was when the minister or justice of the peace who performed the marriage came in to report the marriage information to the court so it could be recorded. December 28th, day, 1852. Married by me, Jesse Coffey and Margaret Williams, both of this county. Jesse Coffey, his age 20, here's his birth date. Margaret Williams, her age 19, here's her birth date, signed by the minister. A marriage register over here was a book where the town or the county clerk recorded a marriage. It included marriage date, day names, age, birthplace, parents' names, occupation, and who performed the marriage. A marriage certificate was given to the couple after marriage by the individual who performed the ceremony. So how to prove relationships and extend a line using vital records and substitute records. Here's an example of Southern research project that followed just two generations of male ancestors in the Ellis family. Sometimes the birth, marriage or death records can't be located. This research projects uh, project will give you uh, some ideas of how to prove relationships and extend a line using vital records and vital record substitutes. So remember that you always work from known to unknown. So search for death records first because they are the most recent record for your ancestor. Here's what I learned from this death certificate. Patrick Reed Ellis, male, died 1979. He was white. Irish ethnicity, he was only 47. Here's his date of birth, where he was born in Tennessee. He's married to Margaret Coffey. He worked as chief security and SAC headquarters. He worked for the government. He died in Omaha, Nebraska. He died in a hospital, a United States Air Force hospital. He resided in Bellevue, Nebraska. There's his address. His parents, Edmund Ellis, his mother, Ludi Artis Dixon. There's his wife, oh, I miss this. Was the deceased ever in the armed forces? Yes, in 1951, he was in the military during the Korean War. The informant was his wife, there's her address. Burial date, cemetery in Carter County, Tennessee. There's the mortuary. There's when his doctor saw him last, here's what he died from, melanoma, and he had it for 13 months. 
So in a death record, informant is very important. Make sure to learn the relationship of the informant to the deceased. Is the wife reliable? Her residence is the same as the deceased. Was she likely present when he died? Does a wife usually know the birth date and birthplace of her husband and the names of his parents? How old was she when she was an informant? She's probably in her 40s because her husband was only in his 40s when he died. So that means she was young and her memory's still intact. But could the informant have made a mistake? Another important piece of information is the burial recorded on the death certificate. The death took place in Nebraska, but he was buried in Tennessee. His birth was listed as Tennessee, so he was probably taken back to a family cemetery, which is gonna lead the researcher to look for cemetery records for other family members. What can you prove with a death certificate? The death date and the death place, because it was recorded close to the time of the death. The rest of the information came from the informant, so you're gonna to wanna to make sure the informant was correct by finding other documents to corroborate the birth date, place, and the names of the parents. Here's a marriage record for Patrick Ellis and his wife, Margaret Coffey. It shows an intent to marry. Can you trust everything in this document? Margaret Coffey told me that the judge that married her and Patrick was drunk. This is a government document from a judge and it has several mistakes. Her name was typed as Mary Coothy. He underlined Mary, put in Margaret. Uh, he wrote Tennessee incorrectly. He got the year wrong, her age incorrect. She stated to me that she was just one month away from being 19 when uh, she was married. Here's a copy of a certificate that was often given to a married couple in court right after the marriage ceremony. So you wanna compare this information with the marriage license. They both cite Patrick Reed Ellis and Margaret Grace Coffey signed. So that tells you that her name was not Mary Coofy. Here's the official marriage certificate, which proves the marriage between Patrick and Margaret in 1951. So you wanna read everything on the document and ask yourself, does everything make sense? The bride was born or was living in Johnson City, Tennessee. The groom was living in Milligan, Tennessee, which is just a few miles from Johnson City. So why in the world did they get married in South Carolina? Aiken County is over 200 miles, or Aiken is Aiken and Aiken County is over 200 miles from Johnson City. Usually a couple would marry where the bride lives. So what was going on that might be a reason for them to get married somewhere else? So I went back to the death certificate to look for hints, hints and noticed that 1951, he stated he was in the military. So I asked myself, is there a military base near Aiken? Nope. So I go, the death certificate leads me to Patrick's military records. So I discover that in March, 1951, he enlisted in the Air Force, and in August 1951, which is when they married, he was sent to Camp Gordon, Georgia for air police training. And when you look at Google Maps, I noticed that Aiken is only 36 miles from Fort Gordon. So it would have seen that Patrick and Margaret, who were married in 1951 in August, wanted to get married before he took off for weeks of training. I would never have thought to look in South Carolina for a marriage record or known why they went there to marry without knowing about his military history, which is a substitute record. A thorough search could provide no birth certificate for Patrick at the state level or county level. His mother told him he was born at home. It's not uncommon for a birth certificate not to be filed when the children were born at home. So what did you do next? Look at the timeline. And then what other life events could contain birth information that would corroborate what was on the death certificate? Family Bible, school records, church records, military, newspapers, cemetery records, census records, all corroborated the death certificate information. So what's been proven? Birth, marriage, death, and parents. Think of vital records and census records as the framework for your research. Vital records substitutes 
corroborate or may even dispute mistakes on vital records. Substitute records can also be used to prove birth, marriage, and death when no vital records can be found. Patrick's vital records, the death, the certificate, the marriage record, the substitute records, all proved his relationship, his birth, marriage, death, and his parents. So you can go on to the next one. I ordered an official uh, certificate for Edmund Ellis, but it didn't arrive in time for this webinar, but I do have a transcription from the death certificate, which, which gave me all of this information about him. Here's what I learned. I got his birth year, his place, his parents. He was never in the military. He was a locomotive engineer. He resided in Tennessee and Johnson City, and he died and was buried in Carter County. The informant's his wife, which is a good source. She should know all this information. It's likely accurate, but I need to check substitute records just to make sure she, what she provided was accurate and that it was recorded correctly. So a thorough search could provide no marriage or death certificate, or excuse me, birth certificate for Edmund Ellis at the state or county level. However, because of his death record, I made a timeline of what I learned from his death certificate transcription and thought about what life events he could have been a part of that might have created additional records. I couldn't find a church records on him for a marriage, and I couldn't find a, an announcement of a wedding or anything like that, anything, but I and I could not find a birth record, but I found a delayed birth record of one of his siblings, which corroborated his birthplace and his parents' names. In addition to all of this, all of that, I was able to um, verify the information on the death record. Um, also, FYI, do you remember how Edmund reported on his death a record that he had not served in the military? but I used his World War I registration to help me out for his birth. Ancestry stated that 98% of all men eligible for the World War I draft filled out a draft registration card, but only 20% of those men ever served. So even if your ancestor never fought in World War I, there should be a draft registration card for them with valuable information. Vital records plus substitute records proves proof of relationship. In proving only those two generations of Ellis men, we used vital records and several substitute records that provided the birth, marriage, death, and the parents. Family Search has many more examples of substitute records or vital records. So I want you to see the webinar handout for links. So now you could go on to the next generation. In summary, uh, birth and death certificates began in the early 1900s. Some counties or cities recorded birth and deaths earlier, but that depends on where you lived. You can find marriage records earlier than births and deaths in most states. Marriage records were created before and after a marriage. Vital records can be located at the state, county, or city level. It all depends on your state. Don't forget to search for vital records at archives, libraries, and historical societies at the state, county, or city level. Determine if they have online records you can access. Search all the major online databases like FamilySearch, Ancestry, Find My Past, and My Heritage for vital records. Each may have different collections of records. On FamilySearch, search the wiki, the catalog, historical records, and images for records. Vital records provide explicit information to provide birth, marriage, death, and relationship. A birth record states, this baby was born on this day in this place and is the child of these two people. A marriage record states clearly that these two people married on this day in this place. A death record states that this person died on this date at this place. Mistakes are sometimes made on vital records. Substitute records can give evidence for birth, marriage, and deaths and corroborate and verify information on a vital record, or it can be used when no vital record exists. 
Remember to always move backwards in your research from known to unknown, proving death, marriage, birth, and relationship before you move on to the next generation. You can find vital records in a multitude of places and in various forms. Hunting them down is the tricky part because every state is different. Okay, that's a mouthful. I hope this presentation has been helpful. A handout with some helpful links is attached to this webinar. Thank you for watching and good luck in your research. Here is a list of my sources for this webinar. Thank you again. All right, thank you, Laura. Um, it looks like we have one question in the Q&A, but if anyone else has any other questions, please type them. So Kaya Schultz, his question is, how do you suggest trying to find marriage information in early South Carolina? Uh, I would go to church records. Have, have they, has she looked at church records? Then another, another, you're gonna have to probably use substitute records because um, they're not available. So you wanna, have you done a census survey? I'd say do a census survey, uh, look for church records. Uh, you know, if they were, if he served in the civil war, you might find a pension record that would, where she would have to prove a marriage. Um, the best thing that I think you could do is to go to Family Search, go to South Carolina. You might look up South Carolina uh, Vital Records Family Search. You just Google that and it should bring you up to a page where it will say, if you're looking for a marriage record, here's where you go in South Carolina. So um, that's that's my best suggestion. I use Family Search a lot, you know, just, just for that to say, okay, what have I forgotten about that maybe I haven't thought of to go uh, of where to search. So try that. I'd also, you wanna search all of the, um, if you have access to Ancestry, you can't look at, um, if you have an Ancestry account, you can, you wanna look at their online trees, member trees to see if anybody else has a family Bible or they've posted something like that. Um, same thing with family search, um, remember, Find My Pass has a lot of church records. You might look there. County, and always, always call the, uh, get on US Gen Web for South Carolina and contact uh, the coordinator for the county because really they do know where everything is. I hope that helps. All right, it looks like we don't have any other questions, but the handout link is in the chat. Uh, I can send it one more time in case anybody missed it. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on January 26th with Catherine Grant. She will be giving a presentation entitled Best Practices for Entering Information in Family Search Family Tree, Part 1, General Principles. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.